Hello, welcome back to the lecture on advanced materials. So it's Spintronics part. And the previous lecture we discussed a bit what are the advantages given by Spintronics. We also discussed what is the current status and maybe a few words about future evolution of electronics, where Spintronics can be complementary and can enhance electronics further. And today we are switching to a more physical part. And uh, since Spintronics operates with spin polarized currents, makes sense to refresh our memories here about electric conductivity in general. That's what most of you know already. So I would like to speak with a more standard classical model of electrical conductivity developed by Drude. So it's named Drude model. And uh, now we are discussing just some piece of metal, for example, a conductor with some sizes, lens L, yeah, and it has area E, and then you all know all these uh, parameters uh, for resistivity and resistance, how they are coupled together. And if you would like to discuss electrical conductivity, what you can do, you can write uh, this formula, which is nothing else as a second Newton law in the left side you have mass of electron and here it's acceleration which is simply time derivative of velocity of electron and on the right side you have force external force and we consider here two contributions the first one it's a force which acts on your electron e when you apply electric field e large then it simply starts to accelerate your electron and it starts to move along the field and there is another force since our conductor is not ideal. There are scattering centers presented. And it means that the electron is accelerated, scatters, decreases its velocity, and then again uh, start to accelerate till it reaches the next scattering center. And this process you can uh, describe with such uh, additional uh, term, which is given by this drift velocity divided by characteristic scattering time Vd to tau, so such a friction term. Vd you can uh, define as a real velocity of electron minus its thermal, it's a drift, uh, yeah, so it's thermal, average thermal velocity. So this is um, electrons when they're moving in bodies, they constantly change as they're velocity and if you remove uh, a light electric field you can define some average velocity and this is exactly what you have here and drift velocity is the difference of this two. Good, then what you do next when you have such simplest formula you consider stationary regime. Stationary means that you apply some voltage and there is already current flowing and uh, nothing else changes in the system. In this case, you can say that variation of velocity of your electron is equal to zero. And then from here, you can uh, define uh, the, so this part is equal to zero. And then from this two, which are equal to zero, you can define drift velocity as a function of applied electric field. And you see that this drift velocity is also proportional to tau, the characteristic scattering time. So it means if tau is large, it means that long time passes between two scattering events, then drift velocity is high. If you have often scattering, then drift velocity is small. So as we expected, here staying also mass of electron. Or if you go more advanced, um, parts and you can say that here's the effective mass of electron, not its real one. So the effective mass is, distract, uh, is subtracted from the band uh, model of uh, free electron gas. Good, then we have to introduce this very important parameter and it's easy, very easy to do. If you take the drift velocity and you normalize it with applied electric field, this one, you kind of get rid of the external force which acts on your system when you apply electric field. So this is more characteristic of the system itself. 
of your conductor, then this characteristic has name by a mobility. Yeah, and it simply can be found as E tau M. Like here. Good. The next step you can do is from here you can come to simplest Ohm's law, which you know very well. Uh, so electric current density yet it can be found its amount of um, electric charge transferred per unit of time. And here that's how you can define it. So this E and N, it gives you more or less amount of, it's proportional to amount of charge which you transfer and its density of electrons. And time is sitting within this diffusion lens. And then if you will plug in, uh, instead of VG, you will plug in this value then you will get this famous formula for uh, electric current density as a function of electric applied electric field, which is uh, Ohm's law. And you see that current is proportional to the density of electrons. So the more carriers, charge carriers you have, the larger will be your current, but also to mobility. It just describes your characteristics. Then one more parameter which we use in pretty often when we speak about electric currents is electric conductivity which is one over electric resistivity you can define it again you just from Ohm's law you just divide your to this, this electric field and this one is, is proportional again to density of uh, electrons to and to the uh, characteristic scattering time or it's proportional to mobility Okay, so that's it about the basic Drude model. And, but this is very classical model. So you see, we didn't use quantum uh, physics here or something. We didn't use our modern understanding about solid body. And uh, therefore, and this model is rather old. Uh, and if you will then have a look on these parameters, you will find a strange thing. For example, as a scattering tri time, so this tau, we know that it's a order of 10 to the power minus 14 seconds. So this pattern occurs very, very often. And the thermal speed of electrons, this thermal, is around 10 to the power of 5 meter per second. And if you then plug in these values into the formula, you will uh, find out that the mean free pass which is uh, tau multiplied with uh, velocity is uh, laying within the Onstrom range. So it's atomic scale and Drude assumed that electrons are scattered and they each nuclear and uh, free pass is Onstrom. But this is not the case because we know that uh, in electrons propagate if this is a crystal propagates uh, long many many the latest constants of your material, especially if you will go to mm, uh, low temperatures and high quality samples and principally your electron can fly 10 to the power 6 or something orders of um, magnitude of periods of your lattice constant. So we cannot, uh, we definitely do not see the situation that electron is scattered on each atom or ion of your lattice. Therefore, this uh, model should be modified and in particular we need to take into account Fermi-Dirac distributions and um, and quantum nature of electron. But before we will switch to Zomerfeld model, give me a minute I will present you the <laughs> very fun imitator of uh, Drude model. Uh, so I cannot say that this video is um, my favorite one, but what I do like is the simplest experiment, uh, how they imitate electric conductivity. Then they have this needles, which works as a scattering center. You see it's through, through the models, <laughs> electron scatter on each atom, uh, which you know is not really the case. And uh, also very nice how they uh, demonstrate here, visualize here the electrical potential. So simply putting here more books, increasing the slope of this board, 
you apply kind of different voltages. And what is definitely wrong about this model is that electrons have different colors here because we know that all electrons are identical. Good, let's have a look. In this video, we're going to look at a mechanical model for the behavior of bulk electrons in a wire. This bed of nails represents the inside of the wire. Think of each nail as a positive nucleus inside the metal lattice. Right now, our wire is topographically flat. The whole wire is on the same bleacher. What happens if we put some electrons in this wire? They just sit there. To be clear, there should be the same number of balls and nails, but that would be annoying. In reality, it's all the anyway, same. let's make things more exciting. We can use this book to raise one side of the wire up. The two ends of the wire are now on different bleachers. There is voltage between the two sides. We could also point out that the slope of the board represents the electric field in the wire. Let's use this stick as a capacitor plate. We can pump some electrons out of this plate. These electrons don't want to be on the high bleacher. They want to go to the bottom bleacher. Let's let them do it. Here we go again. This time we're going to have a higher voltage across the wire and a steeper electric field. This time the balls travel much more quickly. When we roll a ball down a ramp, we expect the potential energy at the top to be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom. Does that happen in this system? No way. Where does the missing energy go? Although the balls want to accelerate down the ramp, they are constantly bumping into the nails, just as electrons in real wire would be bumping into atoms. This makes them back up before they can start accelerating down the ramp again. This graph shows the speed of an electron over time as it descends the ramp. Because of the electron's small mass, the acceleration will produce a very high speed, but since it's constantly hitting stuff and stopping, the average speed of the electron is actually quite small. Each time a ball hits a nail, the nail vibrates, and we hear a little tink, tink, tink. When the ball hits a nail hard, there's a louder tink. When an electron hits an atom, it vibrates and produces heat and light. The higher the voltage we use, the faster the balls travel and the more heat and light we can produce. Here is a new version of my Druid model. As you can see, there are three different parallel ramps. Each section uses different size nails in a different lattice pattern. How do you think the marbles would interact with these different ramps? The average velocity of an electron as it travels down the length of a piece of wire is called the drift velocity. As the name implies, the electrons don't move very fast at all. In most metals, the drift velocity is around one millimeter per second. Here's a flashlight. Let's imagine that we can see inside the flashlight and watch the electrons that leave the bottom bleacher get pumped up to the top bleacher, go through the bulb, and then come back to the low bleacher. How long would such a trip take? If the flashlight is one foot long, then the loop of wire connecting everything would be about 60 centimeters long. An individual electron would take over 10 minutes to take a lap around the flashlight. Okay. So, hope it will help you to memorize the process. And uh, of course, this last point is very interesting that we, when we switch on light in our room, we don't have to wait many minutes before it will start working. And the reason behind is, of course, uh, electromagnetic wave, which you should take into account and which propagates with the speed of light. Good. But now I would like to make a step in the direction of quantum physics and um, to have a modern understanding of electrons. And here we are talking about so called Sommerfeld model. So, as we know already you know, from a free electron gas model, you can describe all your electron system in a form of gas of particles. And then you have to switch to reciprocal lattice where instead of coordinates, you are talking already about momentum of your electron uh, or the number. And uh, then you can define so-called Fermi sphere, 
in this coordinate. So principally sphere means that you also have a third coordinate kz in our direction. And the surface of this k sphere is a k Fermi, which corresponds to this uh, electrons which have energy lying at the Fermi level. So this is the highest field level of electrons. And what is the most important of all this model is, of course, um, the fact that you cannot change position from, ele from one electron to another within the sphere. Because uh, if you want to change, to scatter electrons, this point to here, you will have a state which is already occupied by this electron. And this brings us to the very important conclusion that all these electrons do not influence the characteristic of your material. And what matters are only electrons which are lying on the thermosphere with the, the frequency range, with the energy range KBT, Boltzmann constant of temperature, so thermal energy. Okay. Yeah, this picture is taken from uh, the book of Cross and Marx, First Corp of Physics, therefore it's in German. What happens if we apply electric current to our system? Then in this new model, we can describe it simply as a displacement of Fermi sphere. So this is without any external force, without electric current, uh, electric field, but if we have applied electric field, then we can describe it as a shift of the whole sphere to some value delta K. How large is this delta k? Again, you can do the same mathematics which we did already, second Newton law, with the difference that momentum mv, you replace this quantum mechanical momentum, which is some constant times uh, momentum k, h k, k. And then on the right side, you have this uh, energy, which is uh, so external force, which triggers the electric current. If you will now take uh, integrate left and right side, you will come to this formula that here is difference momentum in time moment t and minus uh, momentum in the original point time. And here will be staying some time t. And uh, what you can do is just say that this difference in k, it's nothing else is our delta k, which we're searching. But here, of course, in, instead of this t, you just replace place your tau, which is characteristic time between collisions. And then you're coming to the formula, which couples your delta k with uh, uh, characteristic of material, which is tau, which is sitting here. Having this model, principally, you are coming back to uh, the same uh, electric conductivity which can define n e square tau divided on m. So what you uh, can go, uh, make one step further, since you now understand what is stand behind these parameters, you can replace tau with L divided with Fermi velocity. So L is an average free pass. So this is a distance which electron uh, propagates in average between two collision events and tau it's a uh, scattering characteristics in the time between scatterings and fermi this is fermi velocity so this is speed with which electrons move and this are not speed of all electrons this is a particular speed of electrons sitting in the fermi uh, surface uh, two more a few more words about um, this n so you see we didn't switch here to the uh, another density of electrons. So there is a little contradictions between uh, books, Kittel, uh, Gross, Marx, or Huntlinger. Uh, they all present it slightly different, but uh, formally speaking, we did not uh, in replace this n with a new density of electrons. So, because when we know the volume of the sphere, you know the thickness of this surface, it would be really easy to do. And nevertheless, as we will see in this course of lecture, particularly the electrons at the Fermi surface define magnetic properties, for example, of our solid body. Yeah, you probably would like to know how large is this delta k. And for this, you can use such estimations. So you 
multiply field of 10 to the power of 2 volt per meter. Scattering time the same as we had in past, so 10 to the power minus 14 seconds. And then you can get that shift in the um, uh, thermosphere is only around 10 to the power of 3 number centimeters. And if you compare it with the radius of the sphere, which is k Fermi, you will see that this is 10 to the power of 8. So it means that the shift here is five orders of magnitude smaller than the, the sphere itself. Therefore, just keep in mind that in real situation, the shift of sphere is very, very little. Nevertheless, it's sufficient to get electric current and all other physical phenomena. Let us speak a bit about resistivity of metal. And here we can start with simplest empirical rule of Matheson's rule, Matheson's rule so-called. And he said that the total resistivity of your material, of your conductor, can be defined as the sum of resistivities, different one. In particular, you should con consider the scattering of um, electrons and phonons this row L, and in, in addition, you have to consider scattering of electrons on defects, or I, so in impurities. This is lattice. Um, in some books, you will find that this scattering on defects is also split into two, scattering on the defects which align within the body, and in other cases, uh, we can define um, scattering on surface because in modern science, we pretty often work with um, uh, ultra thin samples, uh, the thickness, let's say one nanometer, and then of course, contribution to the scattering on interface, on surface of the sample is much is dominating, in principle, not so much interested what's going on inside. But here I will leave it just a general, I will add it as phonon contribution and impurities contribution. Uh, in addition, you can also rewrite this the same formula in terms of relaxation rate. Uh, so relaxation rate, its rate means something one over relaxation time. And you just write that relaxation rate for general is defined by the sum of this inverted uh, relaxation times. And uh, again, tau L is relaxation time because of collisions with phonons and tau impurities relaxation time because of collisions with imperfections. And uh, good volume plus surface, as I said. Let us have a look on this uh, table, which is taken from the book of Kittel. And uh, so he what it shows is periodic table of elements in which conductivity and resistivity is written and Conductivity is written in gray and resistivity here in white. It's ohm per centimeter, so this is CGS units. And as you can see, um, let us find which materials are good conductors. This means that this white value is small and you immediately see that copper is a very good conductor. That's why we also often use it in uh, our everyday life, so wires which we have in in home for power socket is are made usually of copper or of aluminium because aluminium is also a very good conductor. What other materials are good conductors? Silver and gold are good conductors, but they are more expensive, therefore we use copper and uh, aluminium. But if you look, for example, on iron, which is magnetic materials, and its conductivity around five times larger. And if you will move, for example, to titanium, then its conductivity around 20 times larger than copper. Yeah, so there is a uh, set of materials which, which show very good conductivity, and there are which are worse. Uh, when we speak about resistivity of conductivity, uh, then of course, first question you need to ask at each temperature you measure. Because this is something which strongly depends on temperature. And we have to uh, consider here two regimes, when temperature is low and temperature is large. 
and what fills our temperature scale in these two parts is the by temperature. So here we have to say a few words about uh, the by model, which uh, considers uh, uh, phonons of the system in a box, which was used to describe many physical parameters of a solid body. And the by temperature, it's a measure for the speed of sound in your system. And then if your temperature is much higher than the by temperature, then uh, our resistivity is proportional to uh, temperature simply. If you are working with uh, low temperatures, which means be below the by temperature, then uh, the by model, strictly speaking, gives you t uh, temperature to the power of three uh, value. But in real, uh, reality, you have to take into account that electrons after each scattering event are deaccelerated and they can also change angle uh, in which they propagate after scattering. Is taking this into account, it's all described good in here, Gross Marks book. Uh, but if you take into account these factors, then you are talking about t to the power of five dependence. And now how our my resistance uh, behaves with changing of temperature. Here it looks like this. And you immediately can understand that there are two, uh, uh, two contributions. One contribution is from temperature, and it's simply linear here, as we discussed, and here it's t to the power of five. But in addition, there is a contribution from impurities and imperfections, um, which is not dependent on temperature. Yeah? So if you have sample, uh, you made it better or worse or different techniques, you have different numbers of imperfections. And when you change temperature, this number of imperfections doesn't change. Therefore, you have such a constant uh, value where, which uh, to, uh, con constant contribution to resistivity, which doesn't depend on temperature. And of course, contribution from phonons strongly depends on the temperature uh, and strongly influences uh, resist the resistivity because uh, the resistivity of your material is proportional to the density of phonons. So if you increase temperature, you have more phonons, more scattering centers, and uh, electric current is suppressed. That's why resistivity increases with temperature. If you go to, where, to zero temperature, you can uh, uh, assume that there is no more lattice motion of your um, crystal lattice and uh, there, there are no photons, phonons. And as a result, your resistivity of your material is given only by the contribution from impurities. Good. Then we need to introduce one more parameter, which is just residual resistance ratio which is uh, defined, so this is three times, triple R, uh, which you can find as resistivity of your material at room temperature, normalized with resistivity at zero temperature. So usually it's, you measure down to some temperature and then you extrapolate and you know what is your row zero, we plug it in here. This RRR is an indicator of sample purity. Um, so it's, uh, let's say good conductor, it uh, has RR of equal to 1000. So in this case, uh, concentration of impurities is 20 particle per, parts per million. So this is quite good uh, quality, but this value can be higher if you try hard to make a higher quality um, material, or if you have bad conductors and this value can be 10 or something. Let us have a look on this experimental data taken from Kittel book. Uh, this is dependence of resistance as a function of temperature for potassium. And with different concentrations of impurity. So it means that you have a material and then you try to keep it pure. And in another case, you introduce, introduce on purpose impurities in order to increase the amount of uh, scattering centers. And then you have this uh, characteristic. And first of all, this curve immediately gives us an understanding where the switch of uh, regimes happens. And you see that these are low temperatures. So um, above, so let's say, slightly more than helium temperatures than 4.2 Kelvin. So this is uh, 
where we should expect different behavior. And what is also very good that we clearly see this theoretically predicted behavior of the resistance on temperature. So we really have here this re residual um, resistivity. And uh, resistivity for pure sample is much smaller than for a sample of these impurities. Okay, so that's it. That was a refresh of your knowledge about electrical resistivity. We have introduced all these parameters like mobility, conductivity, which we will use in the next parts of this lecture. So now we are ready to switch to the two-spin channel model.